Okay, pal. Let's see. Okay, everybody. Welcome to episode eight of the Tree Peakers podcast. Very special guest here today. This is my buddy uh, Arnold. Yeah. Right? Arnold Clifford. And he's agreed to get on camera with me. He's not worried about remaining anonymous. Uh, he's got some stories to tell from the Fruitland area uh, going towards what? Shiprock? Uh, uh, Shiprock area and then uh, Chuska Mountains. Chuska Mountains. Uh, anything past there or are we going to stay within that area? Oh, uh, I'll probably try to stay in the area. Okay. And then uh, one story I'm going to probably go down to near Saru uh, Saru region. Not sure where that is. How? That's, whereabouts? Uh, south of Farmington, about maybe up, 70 miles. Hold on. Are we talking south, like going like on the Vistai Highway? Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Anybody that's familiar with my podcast, I won't go too far into detail, but um, mm -hmm. my story, my encounter, maybe I shared a little bit with you that yeah. day when I met you last yeah. week at work, yeah. uh, was the Vistai Badlands. I mean, if you're talking, so what, Vistai is about 45, 60 mm -hmm. miles out? Mm -hmm. So right in that neck of the woods, right? Yeah. Yeah, I knew, I know it. I know that's what happened to me that night 21 years ago. But uh, learning more and more about this subject, uh, it's undeniable to me that, that we were surrounded by him that night. But um, you're the guest tonight. It's not about my story. It's about yours. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to dive in. So we've got a few different stories, but we're maybe even touch on the UFO subject here tonight. Yeah. Okay. So Arnold, which one do you want to talk about first, my friend? Oh, maybe I'll talk about my own experience first, you know. Okay. Uh, and this is out... Oh, this is out at uh, near Cove, Arizona, south of Cove, Arizona. Cove, Arizona. Now, the way I met Arnold was uh, I was at work last week. I've told you folks before who listen, uh, when I bartend, when I serve tables, I meet tons of great people, such as this gentleman here. But I happen to be overhearing Arnold tell his server whereabouts he lived. And uh, she's a good friend of mine, Paula. She was talking with him. And when they were done talking, I moseyed on over. And I happen to sit down and say, hey, pal, uh, any Bigfoot mm -hmm. stories from whereabouts you live? Because I heard uh, mm -hmm. the area he was talking about. So we're going to kind of travel uh, back in time here since some experiences you had. We're going to start in Cove, Arizona. Yeah. How far away is that? Oh, it's about like 25 miles southwest of Shabbat, maybe okay. about 30. Okay. Is it like, uh, so when you're like going past the big... Shiprock Monument headed headed that way. Yeah, towards the uh, you pass the Shiprock Monument and you start going towards the uh, the mountains. Yep. What do they call the Luka Chukwe Mountains, Chisco Mountain area? Okay. There's a lot of stories from the Chisco Mountains about Bigfoot from yeah. like, a lot of different individuals that that kind of confided me some of their stories. Right. And then uh, I you know I I, I was mainly gathering stories throughout the years about different people's experience. This is a, uh, something that's interested you in. Yeah, so I've always been interested in it. Yeah. And so, on 2008-2007, I was uh, doing a, a survey the uh, south of Cove, about maybe four or five miles. Does this have to do with what you were talking about, uh, the owl survey? Yeah, I was doing uh, like spotted owl surveys in that area. Right. And doing this for, for, for your job, for the Navajo Reservation? Uh, uh, for my job. Okay. And they gave me six canyons to check out. And each canyons are very narrow. There's no trails in them. It's just kind of meanders and it's all overgrown with vegetation. Yeah. And, you know, some areas where you get into... These canyon bottoms are just like V-shaped canyons. Where yep. You have to step like one foot in front of the other, and so real narrow. Real narrow. Yeah. They're densely vegetated. So I used to go there at night, uh, like right around uh, when the sun starts going down. Right. And so this is when you had to do your owl surveying for the listeners. You got to be out there at night mm -hmm. to observe them, right? Yeah. This isn't a daytime survey. Yeah, it's a... Uh, so we're in a pitch... Well, play, it's it's going to get to where it's pitch black darkness yeah, out there. pitch black darkness out there. Yeah. And so I look for him at night. If I find him, I come back early the next morning. And then I try to relocate him during the day, you know. Yep. The owls. So, the owls, yeah. Yep. And so uh, when I went in there uh, a couple of times, I had uh, one guy, my colleague, his name is uh, Ronald Stevens. Yep. And we never carry like no weapons or anything like that. Just our headlamps and go in, go into these uh, real narrow canyon bottoms. And what I do is like I the Navajo tradition is you have to 
ask the bears, you know, the, the black bears, you ask them for permission to, to go to the forest, to the canyon bottoms. Yeah. And you ask them if you could go there into their homeland, and, and, and you, then you, you, uh, you know, you, you establish like, a relationship with them, like a family relationship. Yeah. So in Navajo, we call them, it's a tui, which means my, uh, my grandchild. And when you say shatsu, you know, they'll, they'll come, come close to you like at night when you're in there. But, but you know, I haven't had any, have any really odd contacts with them. You know? Right. And so, uh, every so night... So you guys have a, like an immense respect for the animals mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And every night we, we have a, a black bear either behind us, ahead of us, or on the side of us. But we never had like close like eye to eye contact with them, you know. Right. And so, you know, over the course of uh, several months, we, we knew how the bears reacted, what kind of sound they made, mm. you know, that they were around us. And then after uh, a few months, we started, when we go into certain areas, there's uh, some other, like, uh, animal in there or some other creature in there. They were throwing, uh, like, uh, twigs at us. Twigs and pine cones, because bears don't do that. No, well, yeah, a bear doesn't have opposable thumbs and yeah. hands to... They're not going to throw something at yeah. you, right? Yeah. So this, you started to experience something different, where you could differentiate that it was a there was some done something else out there. Yeah, there, there's something else out there. And then on one occasion, uh, we had Ron, and then this one other young student from the net college. He kept bugging us about taking him in there, so I yeah. finally allowed him to come with me. And so that evening, when we walked in there, right around about eleven o'clock at night, it's pitch dark. It's a very narrow canyon. And there's one area where the, the canyon splits up into a tributary canyon. Mm. And so right at that tributary, is like, there's flowing water on the main main uh, drainage. And there's a huge slab of rock, probably about twice the size of this table. You know, probably about, about that high up. Okay. So I sat on the on the rock just to have my, my lunch. You know, we're having lunch. And this is the story you, you told me the other day? Yeah. Around midnight? Yeah, around midnight, 12, yeah. to, 12 to midnight. So I sat down there to eat my lunch and... Uh, I put my bag off the off on the ground, and then my colleague Ron and the other student were sitting, maybe about twenty feet away on the near the near the stream bed. And so when I sat down, I, I could smell something pretty bad, you know, you know, kind of like rotten eggs or like skunk or whatever. Yeah, know? I've heard the, I've heard about this smell on numerous yeah. occasions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and then I just heard something like uh, crushing the leaves behind me. Like there's a small slope with some shrubs. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, it grabbed. Uh, it, I think it grabbed a handful of, of pebbles, you know, small pebbles, and yeah. like a, a thin slab of rock, like about the size of my phone. So all that, it, it it tossed it right behind me. So it tossed it on the surface of that flat stone, that yeah. flat rock behind me, and you could hear all the pebbles that like, hit at one time, and then it just kind of rolled a little bit, and then they stopped then. The larger piece, it kind of flipped up and it kind of hit me in the back. Yeah. So then I, I picked it up, and I put my arm behind me, and I picked it up, and I, I looked at it, and I saw that little slab of rock. Yeah. And then just that time, I, I turned around really, really quick like this, and I saw the, the silhouette of it, even though it was dark, you know. Of course, yeah. And so he was standing probably about 15, 20 feet behind me, you know. And so, you know, uh, at, for me, what I've learned throughout dealing with like different like like like, like the like the black bears and, and, and other animals, you know, is uh, when I have encounters with them, I, I don't get all excited or it doesn't freak me out, you know. Right, you stay calm. Yeah, I stay calm, and, and I've been doing that for years. And so what I did with this, when I saw that uh, the, the image of that bigfoot behind me, yeah, it's probably six and a half, maybe seven feet tall. It was it's probably like a like an older teenage. Teenage, uh, like uh, on his way up, on his way up, yeah. So, so, so he, he looked, they're even that big at that age. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I think it was more curious than, than being aggressive, you know. Right. Try so, to get your attention. Yeah. And Just it, to see what maybe you how you'd react. Yeah. Or, see how how we react. And then I, I told Ron. I said, Hey, Ron. I said, Hey, let's go and pick up our lunch and go go up another quarter mile on, on, along that stream bed. Yeah. I said we can have lunch back there. And then I said let's. Let's give this uh, fellow some room, you know. Yeah. And so we got up, we kind of walked off, and, and he, I think he walked behind us for a while, and then he just kind of 
I think there's three of us, that's why he's, he's kind of maybe intimidated himself, you know? Yeah. And so after that, he kind of left us alone, but that side drainage that I tell you about, you have to, you have to go bouldering to get, get up to the top of it. Yeah. It's very narrow, so I think he went back up in there because I've seen signs of him in there like a, a few weeks before that, you know? So I think he he hangs around in that. So you guys might have been in his little yeah, in his little area, little corridor or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and that was like from the from the from where we part from where we usually camp going in about maybe four miles in, you know. So you guys would have to park and trek in. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you just park and you're right there by your vehicle. Yeah. yeah. So you guys got four miles to walk in the yeah, dark. Yeah. Just with a headlamp. Headlamps, yeah. Wow. And you would never get uh, intimidated or, or afraid out there. You just have. Uh, you stay calm under the pressure or under, the, under in, yeah. the, in those circumstances. Yeah, I think the only thing that really freaked me out one time is uh, there's there's another canyon just right before that one. See, this was the kind of like the furthest canyon. Right. There's another one right before that, and in, in, in that canyon, there's one area where the bottom of the wash is no no more than a foot and a two foot across. Okay. On this side is like a maybe hundred hundred foot uh, sandstone wall. Wow. Like cliff. Okay. Then on the side, like a slope. So riding that canyon. Uh, so we, you guys are in the middle of that? Yeah. 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 And, we, and we encountered uh, a mountain lion at night. Oh, man. And I got within uh, six feet of it. And so that that's the one that really got my heart going, you know? Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. Was it, did it, and it knew you were there? Did it, it, did it? We had eye, eye contact with it, you know? Right. And then it took off. And, and then uh, once we took off, See, I have these uh, stations every eighth of a mile up these canyons, up for like six miles or so. Okay. So every eighth of a mile, I would do uh, like owl calls. I would kind of hoot at them. Right. Say hoo hoo, you know. Yep. And so. Thank you very much. much. And so by, by doing that, I, I get in contact with them, you know. And they'll, they'll respond back. All right, yeah. And Thank so. You. You're welcome. And so uh, I was doing that that night, and that's how I uh, uh, I, uh, encountered that mountain lion as well. And so, you know, there's other wildlife that, that, that we see. And, you know, like I said, we, when you have respect for the wildlife, the, the, the nature, yeah, they'll, they'll come to you like that. They'll, they'll show themselves and get close to you that way. And they reveal, reveal themselves to you. So during that time, uh, I even had like uh, four owls that uh, visited me one time. One of them sat on my hat. You're kidding me. Yeah, and it jumped up. It sat a foot above me on a branch and it was looking down at me. I was looking up at it. Then I had uh, two owls on each side of me, like two, two and a half feet away right here. Yeah. And then the, the fourth owl was like maybe seven feet in front of me on the ground, you know. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, and there's this uh, Ron and I were, and, uh, and another colleague of ours, and we just sat there. They just sat there for two minutes just hissing at us and... No hooting at us, but no, no aggression or anything no aggression. like that. They're dancing. They're like, like moving really, around. yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome. So that was really neat. You know, so we, we got to experience that out there, out in the wild too. You know. Yeah. So I think uh, they are out there. You know. I mean, up to that point, I was my my I was mainly like really interested in them, and I was kind of like maybe a borderline believer until I actually experienced one standing twenty feet behind me that night. You know. Yep. And you, mm. you smelt the smell that's accompanied with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, smell them. And right, I've heard it attributed to, like you said, like rotten eggs or, mm -hmm. or like a corpse. Mm -hmm. Or any idea uh, along your journey of getting into this subject of why they smell like that? Is it just uh, that they don't bathe or, or they perspirate in a different way that we do? Um, I've heard from a, a First Nations gentleman who emails into this show that I watch on, I reference it all the time on the podcast. It's a great one. You'd probably really enjoy it. The Facts by How to Hunt, Steve at howtohunt.com. Uh, it's on YouTube, mm -hmm. and people write in their experiences to him because he's had a few encounters out in uh, in Canada. He's a big game, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. pro hunting guy, yeah. big game hunter. And um, somebody wrote in one day and said that the reason they smell like that is because they sleep with their kills. Now, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. It sounded kind of interesting, but mm -hmm. there's got to be more to it than that. You know, they like maybe they do sleep with their kills, but uh, I've always thought maybe. maybe it's a defense mechanism. They they excrete mm -hmm. this kind of smell, maybe try to, to let you know they're there or scare you off. I don't really know because yeah, sometimes I, the, the experiences are not attributed with a smell. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, 
it's a way for them to uh, like identify each other. Like you know how animals do. Yeah, like 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 you know how dogs are when they like when they uh, smell feces or when they smell like a dead animal. Right. They'll lower their heads and roll around in it, you know. Yep. And I think sometimes they 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 put that smell on the cell so they can like uh, maybe smell each other from from a far distance. And because, they're right. Their sense of smell probably yeah. they can smell like a yeah. shark can smell blood a mile away or something, yeah. right? Because uh, uh, one of my friends he has a uh, like I have several friends who are farmers along the San Juan River. Yeah. There's one one friend who. Uh, who told me the story like right after it happened is on along the river and uh there was a you know a lot of the farms are converting to these uh you know those pvc pipes okay and so these individual sections of pvc pipes are fairly long and they're pretty heavy yep so i guess he was you know having uh, several people help him out to section them together and he said uh when he came back like the next day he said these pipes are all thrown all over the place, you know. Hmm. You know, even though they're heavy. Oh, yeah, well, it, it, it takes a couple guys to lift yeah, them. Yeah, right. And, and so he said he noticed one pipe where uh, I think what this Bigfoot was doing was uh, it was chasing around a skunk, and that skunk ran into that section of a pipe. Yeah. And somehow he sensed it where it was sitting, and he said he punched a hole through that PVC pipe on both sides. You're kidding me. Yeah, and then he grabbed that skunk and pulled it out. He said you could see the, the furs of the skunk on that, you know, where, where he punched through. And that, like blood on that white part of the, you know, that white uh, PVC pipe. Yeah. And I so think he was going to eat that skunk. Yeah, he's either, he's gonna either eat that skunk or he's going to rub it on himself. Oh, know? yeah. And yeah. get that smell off of that, you know. Right. And then I think the ones that along the river, because there's some side swamps there, and you know, uh, when you walk around in the in the swamps, you know, you smell that that black mud. Mm-hmm. That black mud smells like you know like skunk as well, you know. Right. And so I think they they, they get into that uh, that type of situation. They rub it on themselves, and you know they get that smell on themselves as well, you know. Right, because they're I refer to them as like prehistoric human beings, or um, you know, there's got to be some kind of human component to them, not just mm-hmm. an animal, right? But there is. There is an animalistic nature to them as well. So yeah, if, if they're out there and they're rubbing themselves, it's just it's what they do out there, right? Yeah. They they it's the like you said to identify themselves, to protect themselves out there. So that way, if we're out there in their neck of the woods in the middle of the night when nobody's usually mm-hmm. out there, you're gonna know when they're coming up. They they want you to know, right? They're yeah. they're you're in their territory, right? And mm-hmm. sometimes they're they'll give you a friendly, like you said, a little throw of dust and and uh, pebbles and yeah. whatever and yeah. then sometimes it could be a big boulder yeah. right sometimes they could throw a big boulder at you or whatnot yeah. you know yeah and you know i i, I have i used to have a friend there in shibok and he was uh uh he, he got injured in a car accident and then he started he couldn't walk no more so he was par- kind of paralyzed right and i used to visit him often just to check on him and his cousin and, and his uh, relatives that lived just across the wash from where he lived. One guy, he's uh, an older gentleman, and he's like the, a chapter official at, at Shabbat, Shabbat chapter. Yeah. And he does uh, uh, grazing, like he's a grazing representative. And his farm, his sheep farm, they, they, they got visited often, like almost on a, every three nights or so. They'll get some some uh, person to stop by. I mean, they, uh, that big crew would, would come by. Yeah. And so he he has the best collection of uh, tracks, photos of tracks of Bigfoot tracks. You're kidding me. Yeah, he's had a couple hundred of them. You know. Wow. And they so come around that often. They come around that often. Would he say that he thought it was just the same one, or there was multiple of them? I think there's multiples of them. Yeah. And kind of like we talked a little bit before yeah. we turned the camera on, how yeah. you how you believe that they're. Do you think over everything you've uh, learned over the years with your friends having the farm experiences, you've had your own. Do they live in family units? Do they have, um, do these family units that are here, are they connected to these ones over here and they all kind of intermingle? Or do they keep this, this little, you know, tribe of them stick mm-hmm. to themselves? Do they do they have warring factions? Have you ever heard of anything like that? Or, or are they so pretty, pretty civil with each other? Or? I think there's individual family units and then there's certain ones where they have like individual groups. Yeah. Like a tribal setting, but, yep. but not, 
not very extensive because I think they're hiding. And right there, that, that, that their scene, safety depends on them staying hidden. Yeah. I mean, because they're yeah. obviously out there. Yeah, and, and uh, that that person that I was telling you about, the the guy that has all the photos. Yeah. Uh, and then my my friend who was uh who was uh you know the guy that couldn't walk, he's just on a wheelchair. Yeah. Well, his cousin, and then that guy's uh, that other fellow's uh, nephew. Uh, he got abducted by uh, a group of Bigfoot. This is the one you were telling me yeah. about. He got he, taken he, for a few he, days. Yeah, he said he was taken for four or five days. Wow. And he said they provided him with crude like food, and they let him go to the water, like down the river. And he said after a while they gained, or they gained his trust, and they started communicating with him. But he said they didn't talk to him; they just tele communicated with telepathically. Mind speak. Mind speaking. Yeah, they're talking to you him. You know then, someone that's experienced that. Yeah, and, and they, they 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 talked about where they came from. You're kidding me. Where they were here, why they were here. Yeah. And you know they, they said they come from another solar system, from another planet, and from their planet they were abducted. And then once they were abducted, they brought they were brought into at the surface of the earth. Yeah. And they said that they were brought in to like to kind of like act as spies or act as like uh, you know just uh, observers of the humans from with these uh, aliens and UFO because there's a new like new studies that are coming out saying that they're closely related. You know, every time somebody sees a like yeah. a Bigfoot, there's either right before or right after they would see. Like a UFO in that, that general vicinity. One hundred percent. I talked about this with Brenda Harris on the mm -hmm. last podcast, where it's not every time, but mm -hmm. more often than not, there's orbs or balls of light, uh, UFO, UAPs. Mm -hmm. Now they're calling them right, unidentified aerial phenomena. Mm -hmm. But the classic UFO terminology is associated with a Bigfoot sighting, yeah. and these Bigfoot seem to have these abilities, such as mind speaking, mm -hmm. right, or the telekinesis, yeah, or, or, or telepathy, I should say, pardon me, and um, the ability to cloak, right? Where yeah. one, one minute they're there and, 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 or they'll be, you know, peeking behind the tree. That's why I call it the Tree Peekers Podcast because of a story that I was told out of Boise, Idaho from a hotshot firefighter who mm -hmm. was fighting wildfires. And his spotter, while he was walking, right, could see, he said, hey, you know, what the hell's following you? Is, is that a goddamn grizzly bear behind you, you know? Uh, you know, look behind you, there's a giant bear behind you, whatever. But when he would turn around, there'd be nothing there. And when he would walk and, and the spotter said, it's behind the tree, it's looking behind mm -hmm. the tree, it's right in front of you. He said, as he got closer to the tree, that rotten egg smell yeah. was the worst smell he ever smelled. But there was, so, so the spotter from afar, mm -hmm. who was a mile ahead with the binoculars, could see it right around him, yeah. but he couldn't see it right in front of him. Mm -hmm. So they seem to have these supernatural abilities. Yeah, that's that's wild. I've never heard anybody. Uh, I've heard stories through the podcast I listen to, but I've never heard anyone who happened to have a friend or a, or a firsthand experience talk about experience in the mind speak. Yeah. This is a first for my podcast on the stories. Yeah, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And you said that it took days for them to build up trust to begin speaking yeah, with him. Yeah, they're, they're telling that that uh, where, where they came from and. He said that uh, the other Bigfoot that they, that they that that when they come in and form a larger group is when they either have like a landing when the UFO lands or when they may, might have problems with their UFO when they either they crash or they might land and they sit they, 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 they get away they escape you know and they get away from these UFOs and escape and then he said the reason why they they remain hidden in the shrubs and in the, in the like along the San Juan River and also in the forest of the of the mountains. Yep. These deep canyons where there's narrow canyon bottoms and there was overgrown vegetation. And they said the reason why they hide is they don't want to get recaptured. And they, they stay hidden and, and they try to uh, stay away from being recaptured, being out in the open. So and they don't. Said, so it's not so much to avoid us. Yeah. It's to avoid them. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, uh, like one, there's a, you know, a number of years ago, there was like the, what they call the Crown Point Howler. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of like cops yeah. and like the the Navajo police yeah, dealing Navajo, with it and everything yeah, like that down there. Yeah, there was there was one incident where they had like a, a Bigfoot running that is at 10, 12 foot strides like this, 
like on every step. Man. And he was like, he, and he left footprints on every stride. And then all of a sudden, he said he was either running towards something or he's running from something. And then all of a sudden, he's uh, <laughs> just disappeared, you know. So they might have beamed him up, you know, caught him. Stuff like and he that. was trying to get away. Yeah, yeah. So they're not so much working with the UFOs as they are enslaved by them. Yeah, here? probably enslaved by them. No, because if you if you look at the when you study the old deities of the Sumerian called Anunnaki, I already know all about it. Yeah, and, and so yeah. what they did is they they themselves they kidnapped Homo erectus. Yeah, and then and then what, genetically then, modified, then genetically yeah. modified to, to create humans. Right. So it's been yeah, going they showed on up for, here from another solar yeah. system, right? Nibiru yeah. Yeah. was their planet. Mm -hmm. And that my dog's named Nibiru. I got a dog at home <laughs> named Nibiru. We call him Rudy for short, but uh -huh. yeah, that's how much I'm into this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anunnaki means those who from the heavens yeah. came, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's been going on for a long time, you know. And they're still they're still coming here. Yeah, they're still coming here. And see, uh, we have stories about them. We have we have a name for the for the aliens. The ones that came down to Earth are called the Anunnakis. Yeah. The ones that stayed. In, in the orbit around the Earth, those are called the Ekigis. You know, they're, uh, they're 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 there to watch, and monitor, monitor, right? What was going on here below? And so, uh, they're, they're like I said, they're are very, they working under like direction of the Anunnaki, uh, or are they different? I think what I I think they're biological clones, right? Because they're kind of like the Greys. They're, they're the Greys are biological clones, right? Because right. they all look the same, right? They have no emotion. They're indispensable. Yeah. And so uh, I think they're, they're they've been programmed to do things to come down to Earth to either like abduct humans or observe humans and, and all this, you know. Yeah, we're kind of like this, you know, planetary zoo, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, somewhere along the line in the last, maybe it's happened in the eons before, as you go way back, like you said, into yeah. ancient Sumeria. Uh, that predates uh, the Egyptians by three to five thousand years. So yeah, we're talking, more that. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. They don't give us the right timeline, right? Mm -hmm. They they give us a false timeline about yeah. what was really going on and how far we go back. You predate the Sumerians. You go back into what's called the Atlantean, the Lumerian area. Mm -hmm. uh, what else do you have? Uh, uh, the reptilians, all those, yeah. right? If all that shit is true, there's some pretty crazy stories that go back, way way back, mm -hmm. further than they tell us. But um, there seems to be this reoccurring theme with, uh, you know, them uh, genetically modifying or enhancing us, and and which I was going to say is within the last hundred years or so, we rediscovered something along the lines of that, because we all of a sudden I mean, look what I'm recording with here. We've got a device that is more powerful than the the computer system uh, that took us to the moon yeah. in the 1960s, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just in our pocket now. So we got this from somewhere. Don't tell me we came up yeah. with this shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no way. And mm -hmm. they say that the military industrial complex, the black budget groups, the higher ups, the ruling elite are 30 to 50 years ahead mm -hmm. of us. This is dead technology to them. Yeah. That's why they're giving it to us, yeah. you know? So that had to come from somewhere. You don't, you don't just like, you know, we're, forgive me for this, but we're not shitting in outhouses and riding on horseback mm -hmm. 100 years ago, and now we are, you know, where we're at now, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I've heard some pretty far out stuff, man. I've heard that, you know, that we, uh, with the military black budget programs, we are out there, we're mining the rings of Saturn, we have a moon base, there's a Mars base. Is it true? I don't know. Yeah. Pretty fascinating stuff when you get into it, mm -hmm. but, um, there ain't no way that uh, that they're telling us everything that's going on. They yeah. know about the Bigfoots. Mm -hmm. They know about the the alien civilizations. But for some mm -hmm. reason, they want to keep that from the general public. Yeah. Um, the the more I've dug into that, I I understand that uh, the ones at the very upper echelon, the thirteen ruling families, all them, you know, the ninety nine or the one percent who have ninety nine percent of the world's money. Um, they refer to us as the useless eaters. That's what they think about mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And. Um, if we're talking about them 13 families or whatever, uh, you can trace their bloodlines all the way back to Samaria. Mm -hmm. All of our elected leaders around yeah. the world. Yeah. Uh, it's a big club, you know what I mean? A big secret society and we ain't in it, which mm -hmm. I'm fine with, but um, you know, it's pretty fascinating stuff when you dive into it, you know? Yeah. But uh, 
Yeah, man, uh, that's that's incredible. That that is one of the most remarkable things I've heard is uh, that you know somebody that's experienced the mind speak and what they telepathically yeah. communicated to them was why they were here and that they're hiding not necessarily from us, but that's why that's why they stay so hidden. Yeah. Damn, this even does. I talked about it with uh, Brenda on my podcast. That I asked her if she had had anybody experience the predator-like effect. Mm -hmm where like the aluminum foil yeah. heat wave effect where yeah. they're there, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And I had told her, if that's true and the Bigfoots can do this, maybe they do come from somewhere else. And I said, and the people who write the movies and all that, they're privileged, they're privy to this information on the inside. And that's where they get these ideas. Well, what you just told me, I mean, that's like I said, think about the predator being in that movie. Yeah. It is something that comes from outer space that's the master of the wilderness. Yeah and can elude man and, and is the master hunter and all this, you know? Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds like a Bigfoot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They changed it a little bit in the movie mm -hmm. and made it into an alien, but yeah. I, I see the, the parallels there. Yeah. Where they could have easily, if they know about this information, mm -hmm. they just tweaked it a little bit and obviously they're not gonna make the movie about Bigfoot because anybody that's into that subject they deem as a kook, mm -hmm. right? Me and you talking about this. We're a couple of nutbags, you know, but, <laughs> but if you get into this and you actually, like, like I told Brenda, when I speak with people such as yourself, when I talk the other day at work, you know, we look at each other directly in the eye. You know, neither of us are sitting here, you know, messing mm -hmm. with the other. We're, we're telling real stories yeah. that we know yeah. about and stuff, you know, it's, yeah. and these people, you know, they're not making this stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're not putting a hundred different put, footprints in the ground and taking pictures just to get their rocks off, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's been going on for a long time. Like, uh, where I'm from, the mountain is a cruise of mountains, and there's a community called Batavatu. Yeah. Which is uh, 18 miles west of Shibrock. And a long time ago, back in the 1864, uh, when the Navajos were being rounded up to be taken down to Fort Sumner. Yeah. On the long walk. So, around that region, is uh, there's a lot of radioactivity going on, like uh, uranium deposits. Yeah. So if you have children that are living next to radioactive uh, rocks and their homes are like, be made out of radioactive material, yeah, you tend to have like uh, you know like, like uh, people who are autistic or you know maybe they're somewhat physically deformed. Yep. Or they might be sick, and so a lot of these children that they gathered in that region at that time, they didn't want to take them on the long walk because they knew the soldiers would kill them right off because they're going to slow them down and. They're gonna be a burden to the to the people who be marching that long distance. Yeah. So what the what the men did is they, they took all these kids up to the top of the, the mountain. There's a place up there in the Aspen Forest where they uh kind of dug out a small area for them like a, in the ground and just left them there because they thought if they would fend for themselves or, or somehow they might be able to survive on their own rather than being like, shot or you know stabbed with a with a saber you know. Yeah. And so they left them up there, and then uh, they came back down, and then they were trying to hide themselves, but eventually they all got rounded up and caught, you know. And then after four years, in uh, 1868, 1869, they, they say that uh, uh, they say that uh, when they came back to the to that region, the ones that survived, they they were wondering what happened to the kids, so they hiked up into the mountains again and uh, kind of went to where they left them behind. How many years uh, past 1864 uh, was this? Uh, four years. Four years. Yeah, and that's uh, the four years that they spent down at Fort Sumner. Under, uh, like, enslavement? Yeah, like a... Uh, in a, a camp? Being, yeah, like an internment camp. Internment camp, okay. Yeah, they're like prisoners of war, you know. Right. And so when they came back, they, they came back to Fort Wingate and to Fort Defiance and they, the ones that lived near the Carrizos, they ventured back up into the Carrizos. Yeah. And when they got up there, you know, they, they, they went back into the mountains after they had, uh, they resettled. And when they got to that Aspen Grove, they saw like a, like smoke, like a smoke coming out of like a crudely made shed, you know. You know, kind of like a, a almost like the a structures. Little a little structure hut yeah, like or little, something? Like a hut. Yeah. That, that was made for them. And then they're they're doing fine, and all of them survived. And so, uh, the 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 men that were that, that that saw these kids when they saw them, I guess the kids were kind of startled for a while, but they kind of uh, readjusted to them. Yeah. And then when they 
went to their hut, you know, they're, they're asking them, like the, the ones that are still not too, uh, not very autistic, you know, the ones that, are, that were, that were uh, like deformed in a certain way, but they, they could still think and speak. You know? Yeah, right. And so they're asking them how they survive and, and how, how do you manage to like uh, uh, survive in the cold and to find food. Yep. And so they, they start telling the story about, uh, like they said, for, 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 for the first four days they were just sitting there. They were hungry, they were thirsty, and then they, they were crying. And then they said, even at night they were just kind of like just sitting there at night. And, you know, they'll cry, go to sleep, and then they'll wake up again. The next day go through the same same ordeal. Yeah. And then they said, after four days, they said, there's these big, tall, hairy men came in to their camp. And they said, these men, they call them hairy men, and they came in, they start creating that crude structure for them. You're kidding me. Yeah, and then they said they, they start bringing them food, like digging out roots or killing like rabbits or deer or something. And so they said that's how they ate, and that's how they survive, and, they, and then they, like they, the, the hide that they ripped off them animals, they, they would use for their blankets. And then sometimes they would stay with them, you know, like when it gets too cold, they would lay next to them, right. warm. And said so they did that for four years, living with these, uh, semi-living with these uh, hairy men. And then they brought them back down, and, and then they had, like, uh, had to have go through ceremonies in order to, to put them back in the right state of mind, you know. Yeah, because they've been yeah. they've been living in in the wilderness, yeah, off yeah. what would now be considered off the grid yeah, uh, or yeah. something, right? Yeah, and, and not living with uh, society or in a civilized mm -hmm. setting, right? Yeah, they with the wild men, right? Yeah. 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 When I was younger, uh, I used to go out there and uh, I go into that same region, that forest. Yeah. That structure was still kind of intact, you know, but over the years with the heavy snow and all that, it kind of just fell down, you know. But they're all the the major logs are still kind of laying there, you know, in the, in the pile. And this is a a story that was passed down through the culture? Yeah, passed down through the years, you know. And so we're talking, for everybody that's into this, and, and those of you who have been watching, um, 1864 to 1868. Yeah. Okay? There's no television sets. There's no Finding Bigfoot mm -hmm. on TV. There's no nothing. These are children yeah. who have... Learning what would now be considered learning disabilities yeah. or you know uh, deformities, yeah. autistic. You spoke about right, mm -hmm. but the ones that could speak, and the ones that had enough uh, uh, mind to be able to communicate what had taken place. Because in the grand scheme of that whole incident that took over four years, those kids shouldn't have survived, mm -hmm. right? No, yeah. they they wouldn't have the the wherewithal because or the means to. To figure it out, and they yeah. say they they claim they were helped by tall, hairy men. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, that, this, that that is the most amazing story. I want to this, thank you for that. That yeah, is just this, fantastic. This is uh, at an elevation of like about nearly nine thousand feet. So there, I mean, yeah, way up there. Way up there. Yeah. So where yeah. during the four years you're going to experience four different winters. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go through heavy snow. Mm -hmm. There's no way they couldn't have made it without help. That's the most amazing story, dude. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. So that that's what, how they survive, you know. So your culture, your 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 people, the First Nations Navajo people, they're very familiar with. The, I, I tell you, mm -hmm. it was it was talking to uh, your people who I have an immense respect for. My best friend in the world, uh, Brandon, uh, is a Navajo, a Native American gentleman. He plays uh, in my band with me. We've been best mm -hmm. friends since we were kids, and. I just have this immense respect for your culture and for so so you sharing that story with me. That's a story I should have never heard. Yeah. Right. It's something that's been shared amongst your people. Mm -hmm. It sounds like for well over 150 years. Yeah. So I really do want to thank you for that. That's that's one of the most beautiful mm -hmm. stories I've ever heard. Um, but what I, my point exactly for that is that you all know this is real. It's not it's not fairy tale to you guys. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not like you know. Even on all the TV shows and these things, you know, they're they're still acting as if, you know, oh, is it really there? We don't know or not. But if you know, you know, you know mm -hmm. this thing. You, mm -hmm. This subject is real. It's it's one of the realest things yeah. out there. If you talk to somebody who's had the experience, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just that's that's got to be hands down the most beautiful story I've ever heard yeah. on this subject. Because a lot of times, some of these stories are kind of terrifying. Mm -hmm. People get real scared. But to me, I, I look at them as as like the humans, right? Like you've got good ones, you got mm -hmm. bad ones, mm -hmm. and you've got some in between. 
Yeah. Right? I mean, I, there are some terrifying stories about them taking kids and this, that, mm -hmm. the other, but it seems like those ones wanted to help those yeah. children. And that's just, that's remarkable. That's awesome. And, and then, uh, you know, there there's other areas of incidents where I know two people personally that were, one guy's my neighbor. He lives right across from where I live at. Yeah. And he used to have a, he has a farm there in, in uh, Hogback. And during the summers, he would go out there and help out his father, like uh, plant his corn and whatnot, you know, on, on, on their field. Yeah. So he's out there spending like several cold months out there, out, out in the summer, out, uh, you know, just camping and uh, sleeping in a canvas tent, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and not really like a structure at, at their farm. And Just tend to, tending yeah, to the land all yeah. summer and making sure they get uh, the crops planted and yeah. get, get them ready to grow yeah. and cultivate and everything. Yeah, and then one summer he, he didn't want to go back. He, he didn't want to go back and he was afraid. His mom kept telling him, go back, go, go take care of the farm, but he, wouldn't, he didn't want to go. And finally he told his mom that, uh, he said, one night he was sleeping there in his tent. And he said, all of a sudden, he said he, he woke up. He said there was a big, tall, hairy Bigfoot dragging him, holding him by the ankles and drag, dragging him outside, out of his tent. He said he dragged him for like about maybe 100 feet. And he said he got all scared. He started screaming and kicking. And yeah. He said that's how he got away from it, you know. He said he finally got away and he, he ran towards uh, like the road like from where his farm is at. Yep. And because of that experience that he had, he never, he never went back, you know. It scared him that bad. Yeah, it scared him that bad. And then there's another fellow from Cuddy Eye, like just uh, west of Shibok. Mm -hmm. He he also uh, one time he uh, I guess he came home. He's uh, he's drinking a little bit, but he wasn't like drunk. And his family reported him to the police. And so when he took off into the down towards the river bottom, because Cuddy Eye is right next to the river. Yep. And so he said he took off and he hit down by the river. He just kind of laid down like because of all these. Spotlights were going up around him, you know, like over the. Oh, head they were looking for him. They were looking for him, you know. Yeah, and so he said uh, he kind of like dozed off for a few minutes, like maybe thirty minutes, to uh, wait out the cops. And he said when he woke up, he said all of a sudden he he, he was also grabbed by the ankle. And he he was, he's dragged like they dragged him for another hundred feet. And he said inside his shirt, you know, all the sleeves that that accumulated in his shirt, you know. Because he had been being dragged yeah, before being he dragged, woke up. Yeah. yeah. And the same thing, he said, he started kicking at it and started screaming and said he finally got away and then he ran back towards the lights where his, where his house is at, you know. He said all that leaves was falling out of his back. And, and, and he's, he also got, got very frightened because of that too. I know? bet, yeah. And so I know two incidents where that happened where people actually got, got dragged under by their feet, you know, uh, in the dark. I wonder what they were snagging him for, for something nefarious or just... Curious why they're out there and going to take them back to their. Yeah, probably kind of like uh, abduct them. Yeah. You know, just curious uh, about them. And so, uh, there's like, like, there's, like I said, there's a lot of activity along that river corridor. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one, there's another family that, that, that was, uh, um, I was very close to. And they had almost like nightly visits. And they said that these Bigfoots would come by and, uh, uh, kind of like mess around with their horses. Oh, you, you were just telling me a yeah, little bit about that and, out and, there, yeah. And he said that, you know, their, 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 their horse's mane and their tails, it, you know, they, they, it was straight, you know, like you comb out their hair and stuff. Yeah. And he said, uh, uh, when, when they felt that they were there at night, when you could he kind of hear the horses running around and neighing and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he said the next day when they go out, they would find their horse's hair braided in a crude way. Be crude, like braided. You're kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, and, a, that's awesome. And, and then, and then their, their their tail too would be uh, kind of braided. So, and, so the horse would be calm enough for them after a minute to, yeah. like they were got familiar. Yeah, with I, it. Guess, I guess they were they were. Maybe there's a couple of them that, that held them down where they could, you know, mess with them that way. I think in a certain way they said one of them were like maybe one of them was trying to mount it from the back like have sex with it. Really? Yeah, and they said that that, that I think that horse kicked them. Because he said that horse had like uh, like claw marks kind of scratch on his rump. Yeah. And then and then uh, I guess when he kicked him, that whatever it was uh, took off. That big took off and ran back into the into the into the uh, shrub, shrubby areas. Right. And then uh, I said a couple a week later, he said they, they, they saw like uh, 
two Bigfoots are out in their melon patches. They said they stole a big, like, couple of big melons, you know? Yeah. And they said one of them uh, uh, stole a sheep from one of his neighbors that he's carrying a sheep like this. And then, so he followed them going into, like, the shrub. And he's trying to, like, like, fall him without being detected, you know? Yeah. And they said they, they get, he had to crawl on his hands and knees to go through the shrub. And, and then they got to, like, a, an opening. And they met other Bigfoots in there, like, like uh, that, that was waiting for them. Where they took the... the, the sheep and the... And, and the, the melons? And the melon, yeah. And then they said, when they got to the other group set, one of them, uh, it wasn't a very large one, maybe like a, like a six, seven, six, six, six footer. He said, he, I guess he might have been the one that got kicked by that horse. Why, he have a limp or yeah, something? Yeah, he's, he's limping. Really? Yeah, he's, he's limping behind the group, you know. Yeah, because he, no matter how big you are, you get kicked by a thousand pound horse. It's, yeah. Especially a, a, a guy that size, yeah. six, seven foot, it's still going to hurt. Yeah. And it's going to bruise you up pretty yeah. good, hit you in the ribs, hit mm -hmm. you in the leg, right? Mm -hmm. Could do some pretty good internal damage, I would think. Yeah. And then, and then uh, he also uh, saw him one time at night. I guess he woke up in the middle of the night to drink water from his, in his kitchen. Yeah. You know, like those kitchens, some, some of those mobile homes have like a, a window. Okay. Right right on the, uh, where the faucet is at. Right. He said mm -hmm. while he was drinking water there at his kitchen, he said he looked over towards the, his yard. He said there's a large trampoline outside his yard. And he said there's several tall ones standing around the trampoline. And this is how we know that they're, they're family groups, you know. And he said that there's like maybe two or three small Bigfoots about that tall jumping on the trampoline like just having fun at night, you know. No way. Yeah, they said they were playing on the trampoline. <laughs> so I think I think they've seen them. They uh, watch the kids. What the kids do? They that, watch you know? off in the distance. Yeah. But they wait till night, and then they know when everybody's asleep, yeah. and they're letting it. So that, that, that that's what I'm saying. They're they're like us. They're there's a they're. Well, you say that they say they come from somewhere else, but is there? There's some kind of humanity in them, mm -hmm. or they just have. I think are, are they there's ancestors be, of be, us. Be, be, because they? they're they're. Maybe related to kind of like primates, you know, you not know, like even the gorillas and the orangutans and monkeys, you know, they, they're, they're young baby ones. They run around, hop around, mm -hmm. climb, you know, like, climb. Yeah. And, and they're playful, you know. Right. All, all animals are like that. Oh, uh, yep. No matter what, like no the young what, cows, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the horses. The young horses. Oh, yeah. I've yeah, seen dogs, you know. Like, all of them. And right? even like goats, you know, they'll hop around like this, you know. Yeah, having fun. Yeah, having fun. So I think that's what they were doing with their, with their little ones, you know. But the, but they it's like they never let their the little ones get too far away, right? They, you yeah. said like the big ones are all standing around because mm -hmm. they're going to protect them. They're going to mm -hmm. make sure they seem very protective of their family yeah. units, family units, yeah. right? Yeah, and and so so that that they have that broad range of uh, characteristics, you know. Yeah, and I've heard like the the violent side too, like the, what you said. Yeah, there's a in, there's an area that's always. Like every once in a while, there'll be reports of Bigfoot down way past Shibrot towards the uh, San Juan River, like uh, to the northwest, about maybe 12 miles. You see some old tribal farms down there, like mm -hmm. maybe, uh, I'd say maybe like 10,000 acres, maybe 20,000 acres of, of wow. farmland that, that's yeah. been abandoned. Okay. And they, they find them down there pretty often. And there's a family down there that's very isolated, way out in the boonies. And so. I think the cops, the Navajo cops, they just hid this, you know. And what happened was, uh, they said that uh, there's an old elderly couple that live near their, near their, their, their sons and daughters, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they said one evening they could hear something outside, you know. You know, there's like something walking. And around. this is miles oh, outside yeah, of town. Yeah. And all the dogs were barking. They were barking, and they could smell something outside. And they said that. Uh, you know that old man. He he walked from his cat, his his hogan to their, to his son's hogan, or his daughter's hogan. Yep. And then he said he was carrying around an axe, you know. And then then they they, they told him they said that uh, he better be careful, you know. And you know the, uh, his, and then that old man goes, I'm all right. I have my axe. You know, he if I see something, I can use my axe, you know. And older gentleman. Yeah, older gentleman. Okay. Like senior citizen. Okay. And then he said he's going to go check on his wife because his wife was uh, in that hog on alone. Yeah. So I'll come back in like, like an hour or 30 minutes. And they say he never came back. So then they were they were wondering what happened to him. So they went out to his, his hog on and they found that the old man got, got killed, you know. 
And his wife was there. She observed the whole thing. and She seen it? She seen it, yeah. She said... Uh, what did she say happened to him? He said that uh, Bigfoot came into their Hogan, attacked them. The old man was trying to use his axe. He yeah. Said, he said that whatever that Bigfoot was, he just ripped out his arm and put that blood all the way across the, the Hogan like that, like the wall, the ceiling. And he said that that's how he died, you know, leading to death. And I guess he got kind of clobbered. And then... Uh, Bludgeoned to death? Yeah, yeah. And, and then... But he uh, left the wife alone. Yeah, he left the wife alone. I guess he, the wife was just screaming. He was mad because when he came in there, he had the axe. Yeah, and he, then, he tried to attack it with the axe. So, know? in in your opinion, do you think he would have been as aggressive if he didn't have that axe and was, or was he coming in for? Because he didn't uh, hurt. He didn't seem to hurt the woman. Yeah, uh, I think know? I think he just uh, committed that murder and then he just took off. You know. Yeah. He went out the. And that's how strong he is. He reaches yeah. in and pulls his arm off. Yeah, just pulls his arm off. What's so crazy? You didn't tell me this story the other day, right? Yeah, yeah. Somebody told me this off the record the other day, uh, that that one had went into a house and ripped ripped the man's arm off. Mm -hmm. um, but you just told me the same story. So it sounds like some of these these stories are have been circulated yeah. amongst the community. Yeah. And, yeah, and, it, it, and that's what the old woman said was... A Bigfoot came in. How yeah. terrifying would that have been? Yeah. Because they smelled something outside. The dogs are going crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's an energy in the air, a palpable enough fear in the air mm -hmm. to where the older gentleman gets his axe and knows something ain't right. Yeah. And then that ends up happening. Yeah. How strong do you got to be to rip an arm off out of a human being? I couldn't do that to you as ma yeah. no matter how hard I tried. Yeah. I mean, that guy had to be a pretty big fella. Yeah, yeah. A pretty big one. With know. a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. You know? And then, so when, when the cops showed up, they, they said it was a, uh, they just said, oh, it's, it's a coyote that did that, you know. You know, a coyote, there's no way a coyote could do that, you know. <laughs> not at all, not at all, but it seems like the, um, and, and this is not a knock on them or anything, but the, you know, the Navajo police, they get a lot of these calls, but... And there, have you seen the show that came out on yeah. the TV? Mm -hmm. And they, they did, they, there was an episode on the Howler, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But they get a lot of these paranormal calls, but there's always like, like you said, it was a coyote or it was, a, you know, yeah. it always, but they know what it is behind, yeah. behind, that they're, it's something about it. They just, you know, who's going to believe them? Yeah. You know, um, you familiar with uh, the paranormal rangers that they are the, pardon me, the Navajo rangers that they had, they had created out there, uh, that little, um, group of, of Navajo police that would deal with the paranormal yeah. stuff. Do you have Netflix by chance? Uh, no, no. No, uh, okay. But I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, they did a, they did a, so they rebooted Unsolved Mysteries, the show from the 90s. Do mm -hmm. you remember that show, Unsolved Mysteries? Yeah. Netflix is a, is a streaming service online and, and they have all these different shows and, and they re, re brought up Unsolved Mysteries and uh, they did a complete hour long episode on the paranormal rangers, the Navajo rangers mm -hmm. and Bigfoot stories, UFO stories. And it was all here. They came here to our town, mm -hmm. Shiprock, Farmington, right along the San Juan River, all the way out. Might even have been the place you said in, said in the name earlier in Arizona, started with a C. Uh, Co. Yeah. Co. It yeah. might have been that place yeah. where there was this mountain and there was this uh, object in the sky that looked like liquid metal or something, but it was molting that liquid metal. metal. It was dripping out, mm -hmm. like dropping, but you could see it was right over the mountain. And it wasn't the first time that something like that had appeared up there, but these Navajo Rangers were called in to, there, there was a specific group of them, these two gentlemen, and they would come out and investigate these because for a lot of the Navajo Rangers who were really, um, what do you call it with your culture that's uh, traditional? Mm -hmm. They didn't want to deal with the Bigfoot cases, the paranormal yeah. cases. Yeah. They even talked about like a, like some, some weird like haunting stuff out on the mm -hmm. Navajo Reservation. Mm -hmm. You know, places being haunted, yeah. coins dropping behind you and there's yeah. nobody there and there's quarters on the ground. You know, really strange yeah. paranormal activity. Have you yeah. ever uh, come across stories like that about? Shiva is a hotbed for that. Really? Yeah. Uh, there's a guy over there, his name was uh, J.C., uh, I think it was uh, J.C. Johnson. Yeah. And he was a paranormal investigator for the Shibok, uh Criminal Investigation Office. Yeah. And I used to talk with him once in a while, and there's like, there's uh, like two big snakes in the river. One of them is black, shiny, with red eyes, and the other has uh, maybe either fur or feathers on it. Snakes? Yeah. About that big, 
And I've seen their trucks, you know. Like big, like ramp? Yeah, they're, they're huge like that, you know. And, and, and so there's stories about that. And then there's a, a one story, uh, I was interviewing some, some police officers from Chirac. Yeah. And this one lady told me about a story where they were called up to the old hospital. On the back side, there's an old morgue and there's like a tree right there. Mm -hmm. And it's like about the size of those pillars there, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit smaller. Okay. And they said when they got there, the the next college uh, security was there and then a the couple of locals were there. They had their flashlights on them. And he said every once in a while, there's like some little creature poking his head out like this, you know. From behind the tree. From behind the tree. And then he said all of a sudden it, it took off and then when the cops got there, they were much stronger. Uh, uh, spotty uh, spotlights. Right. I guess it startled it and then it took off. Back then there was no. Uh, there's a high school now. There, you know, what they call Northwest High School. Okay. And they have all these fences up now, like chain fences. But mm -hmm. back then there was like an open field with all grass, like an old football field. Yeah. And then it goes out towards a, a, a like an irrigation ditch. Right okay. now there's a fence there. Yeah. And so all it said all of a sudden. There's a troll that bursted out of there. Like a, maybe a three, four foot troll. I, I was told it, some of this it, off the record yeah, the other day too. It, it started running. And they said they followed it, like, for chasing it for about like, two, three miles, you know. And there's a, there's a big can, or kind of like a, a like a little Like a little gnome creature? Like uh, a troll? Probably about that tall, yeah, like a troll, actual troll. What do you mean? Like, like, like what you see in you Willow see it, or like, something? Uh, like a beard and you know kind of raggedy clothes and, and you know he he he's, he was so often but like, seen around the, the drainage uh, north of Shibrock. People see this out yeah, there. Yeah, and, and then is said, there more than one? I'm not too sure. I think there's a. Uh, I know that one that was there. You know that they talked about. Does and, that thing? <laughs> I don't want to sound too crazy here, mm -hmm. but you know when I hear things like this, I ask myself, you know. Is this thing coming out of like a portal into our reality or like is it living out there? How does it live? How does it make its clothes? How does it because it's not the first time I've yeah. heard about the trolls yeah. or I was told the other day about the little people. There's little people out you there. You heard too. about that too? Yeah, well like that, you know. Well I was told like this. Yeah, yeah. Off the record I, from when yeah, I was talking some, the other day. Some were small, some were about that big. Then the trolls are about like that. Are they like like so a troll See, so like little small on the knee? Uh, how about right here? Right yeah. here, four yeah. foot. Yeah, yeah. And, Little and, men. Yeah, and then that that troll it, it start running along that ditch. Yeah. And then he said, "There's uh, there's a place where it crosses the like a big drainage and the irrigation ditch. It flows into the a series of pipes that get that cross that uh, that drainage, and then all uh, the water will reflow on the other side." Mm -hmm. So he said, while it was while it was running, even though that that, that uh, metal pipe's like about seven feet high, he said while it was running, he jumped up to the top and ran across that that uh, uh, you know that uh, drainage pipe. pipe. Yeah. Yeah. And they said that's how it got away from the cops. You know, it could jump that high. Yeah. And and, and I think it, it uses that irrigation ditch all the way across the Shibrock, and it goes out on the east side of Shibrock. Yeah. At night, uh, there's a community over there called Indian Village. It's one of the first, uh, there's a North uh, East Laurent Housing, which is NHA. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a Indian Village where you have a conglomerate of uh, homes that were built by individuals. You know, they're all, they're not uniform. Yeah. And that's where it hangs around at night. It'll, it'll walk the streets of that Indian Village at night. And people that, you know, like a lot of the younger younger guys. Like walk the streets, like paved streets? Dirt street. Dirt street. So, yeah. yeah. So sort of like an older style community yeah, yeah. in the modern world. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it, 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 it makes it skittery running towards that uh, irrigation ditch and it probably... It knows it can get away out yeah, that way. Yeah, that, that's it's a corridor to travel like from one end of Shibot to the other. You know. Are you familiar with... I, I feel like, uh, you know, we could do this again mm -hmm. and you have plenty more stories to tell. Mm -hmm. We're just about over an hour here. I know I don't want your food to get too cold. Yeah. We'll go for another 10 minutes if that's okay or so. Yeah. Um, the, the, let me tell you about this one that, that yeah. and we might want to redo this one too later is uh, I used to teach down at uh, Crown Point. Okay. Yeah, uh, teaching uh, botany. And Most amazing stories ever. <laughs> uh, and, Thank you, and Megan. One of my students Appreciate it. Uh, one day he getting close. He uh he started uh asking me questions, you know. Yeah. 
you know, questions about like, you know, uh, UFOs, Bigfoot, aliens, and stuff like that. Right. And so he said that he tried to talk with other school counselors, other like instructors. Thank you. And nobody would really listen to him, you know. They thought he was like, on drugs or might have been drunk and whatnot, you know. Mm -hmm. So then one day I started talking to him and him and his girlfriend out in the parking lot, like after class. Yep. And he started off saying that there's a, some type of a, like a battle that happened at night. You know, and, and the roof, the roof's kind of wooded, you know. So you see these big flashes of light here, like grenades and whatnot. You know, in, in, in the woodland. Okay. And then after that, it said, uh, people start seeing these grays hanging around, around uh, the community at night. You're kidding me. And then they also start seeing, like, the black ops cruising around. And, and so, he said one evening, uh, uh, Like uh, in, like, hum hum Hummers or helicopters? Like, like uh, black vehicles. Okay, and, yeah. And, and he said so one blacked evening, out windows and yeah. everything, and yeah, he said government one, vehicles. One, one evening, he, uh, he said he saw like orbs, you know, light. Okay. And he's he took his flashlight and he started flashing at him. He said he made a mistake by doing that because they came closer to him. And then they started like hanging around his house, you know, those lights. Oh no. And then he said, uh, one day he said, uh, while they were home, he said they, those those orbs, said, I don't know if it's an orb or is it, he, he sure it was a, a, like a small spaceship that landed on top of his Hogan. And then he said, he hurried up and closed off his blinds and they were just turned off the light and sitting there in the dark, propped up some tables and stuff against the door so they could come in. Yeah. And he said, they tried coming in through the door and after that they, they started like, you know, the, those window shades, there's like little holes in them where the stream goes. Okay. Oh, and, yes, yeah, in said, the blinds? Yeah, and, yeah the, the blinds. And he said, every right. hole there's like a, a laser beam coming in, like, like trying to probe inside. Probe like yeah. like they had some kind of like scanning device. Yeah, yeah scanning device. <laughs> yeah, like, like like trying to look through those little holes. Yeah. And then he said that happened all night. And then they they then the, they they were trying not to go to sleep, and, and then they were just frightened. They're sitting. They're all quiet. And then so so he said that happened. He said, well, the day before that, he said, uh, I, I guess that UFO hovered on a big old uh, pinion pine tree. He said it bent down all the branches and poked them into the ground like 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 fence posts. So he didn't break it; they were just bent, you know. And then I guess it was near his horse corral. And then the next night was uh, that incident where it sat on his his hole gone. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, he said, a couple of evenings later, he said they were sitting in their hole gone with their door open, and maybe about uh, 100 feet, 200 feet away. Okay. He said uh, one of those spaceships landed, and they could see the spaceship land. And then they said a little... Out towards Crown Point. Yeah. Out and, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and then the little grays start coming out, you know. They're, they're kind of like walking around their, their spaceship. Yeah. And then he said he had contact with them, like, like eye contact. He said he saw them, they saw them, and then he hurried up, closed the door, propped up all the stuff again. And same thing happened with all those little lights, you know, trying to probe inside. And so that happened like, uh, like every two days, something like that was happening. And then he said, on one occasion, he said, he's, uh, his uncle called him up. His uncle was, uh, called him up saying, he goes, they're all around my house. Shoot him, shoot him, you know. And so he said he looked outside his windows and he could see, like, little grays, the silhouette of them around his uncle's home. And he said he didn't want to shoot over there because he wanted to actually shoot his uncle. Right, shoot through, yeah, yeah. shoot through the house or yeah. something. And then he said, all of a sudden, he saw his uncle over there with a bat or, like, a club. Going like, this is one of them, you know. He said he club one of those grays. He said it actually either injured it bad or he might have killed it, you know. And, and then he he said he up dressed up. He went over there, drove over there, and uh, he said he parked right outside the house and right outside the front door. There was a, a gray laying there, and, and he saw it. Yeah, he saw it. Yeah, said, and his uncle had called him scared, scared shitless. Yeah. yeah. So this and, is just like and, seems to be like commonplace out there. Yeah. All this ethereal. Um, out of the ordinary, uh, you know, paranormal, mm -hmm. wild shit goes on yeah, out yeah. of the Navajo Reservation. Yeah. Are we a hotbed in this area? Is there some kind of vortex, or have you? Has your people talked uh, about? I think it's all the radioactivity that's here. You know, the rain and all the, the the electrical lines draws them in. Yeah, I think they they recharge their their spaceships that way, covering over the power lines and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, a lot of times with some of this craft, you know, you never even know mm -hmm. they're there. Mm -hmm. If they're cloaked out yeah. or 
right? And then all of a sudden, yeah. I mean, I've got videos of uh, my wife and I filming what, what we'll stop the car. All you gotta do is watch the sky. It don't happen every night, but I'll see these balls of light and I've got them mm -hmm. on film and they're going, they're going, and then like they expand, they get smaller. Yeah. But then the best way I can describe uh, Arnold, when, when they disappear, they go like this and like fold in on themselves. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or something opens up and they. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah. But um, I've seen this shit with my own eyes. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've I've filmed a few of them. But it's almost like when when I turn that camera on, sometimes they'll just go. Yeah. Not all the time. I've got like a couple two minutes or minute and a half mm -hmm. here and there. But it's like I've got eyes on them and I'm watching them for a few minutes. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm gonna record this, and I do it. And as soon as I do that, the light starts getting dimmer and dimmer. And it's like, I don't know, like like. How far away is that thing? But yet, does it somehow know that I'm filming it? Or mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm saying, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's an experience I've yeah. had. It's I'm not making it up, you know. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not imagining it. I've got it on film. It wasn't just a hallucination of mine. Yeah. I've seen these things. Yeah. I've never seen something get out of a craft, mind you, or anything mm -hmm. like that. But um, and see when the when his uncle clubbed that or uh, that craze, they called the the sheriff down there. Yeah, the Montezuma or the McKinley County Sheriff. Right. And he said instead of the sheriff showing up, they said there was a uh, black up showed up. And, and you said in the nights leading up to that, you said there was a firefight going on. Yeah. So and, and I think it was a fight between them and the and the and the black ops, you know. What's so the, what I the, wonder the, what they were fighting over, like uh, uh, like they weren't supposed to be there at that time, because you know they have some kind of yeah. treaties with them or something. Mm -hmm. You know the people that get abducted, they have all the same stories about them extracting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, DNA from them or or. Or stuff to procreate, or you know, yeah. taking you know, God forbid, uh, some of the things I've heard about, you know, uh, artificially inseminating women or extracting the, mm -hmm. the sperm from men, mm -hmm. and that they telepathically communicate that their race is dying and that yeah. they have to interbreed with us to keep their. Yeah. I don't even know. It's yeah. some wild shit, but you know, you've yeah. had some pretty high-ranking people. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John D'Souza. Uh, retired FBI agent, but mm -hmm. he's he's known as the X Man. Uh, the all the entire X Files, Mulder, that character was based yeah. off of him, John D'Souza, mm -hmm. and all of the paranormal cases. He was the one that dealt with all that stuff in the '80s through the '90s, yeah. uh, maybe even late '70s. But I mean, some of those case files were out of this world, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But it's real shit, documented evidence. Yeah. This stuff's been going on a long time, way longer than that. But yeah. you 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 know that as well yeah. as I do. But um, what was the what was the end game with all that? What ended up happening? Did it continue going on, or did it end up coming well, to, to well, a Well, uh, they said that in the, in the three or four days, they said the black ops, they, they keep visiting his uncle. They, they shut him up, you know. They either threatened him, and then they also paid him off, you know. Because he said he had a big old bundle of money that he wanted to go spend in Gallup, asking him to take him there. And... So the black said, ops paid him off yeah, to talk about it. Yeah, and then he said after that he just denied seeing them and happening. You know, killing I one think of that them. happens with a lot of people. Yeah, and, right? and then and then he himself, you know, he uh, he kept the spirits and then he he wasn't able to really sleep. And then one day one day he comes in he goes he, I looked at him he looked like he finally got some sleep you know, and I said hey you, you look you look a lot better today he goes oh yeah I said they came by again last night and he said this time they took him. He took him and they, uh, he goes, here, check this out. He rolls up his sleeve and he had four probe marks right here on each side. But he had some on his chest and... You've seen this? Yeah, yeah. And then he said that they, they took him, because he was my student, you know. Right. They, they, they took him and then they, they probed him and then they said they brought him back. That's when he finally rested and went to sleep, you know. Yeah, they put him under and did some experiments yeah, on yeah, him. Yeah. But he got a good night's rest mm -hmm, out of it. Mm -hmm. But you saw these marks. Yeah, you saw it. Yeah. Wow, and then uh, because it, it, it was it, when every session that we had, it was him and his girlfriend that was sitting in their vehicle, and so they, they would start when they were telling me this, these stories, they would start crying every three to four minutes, you know? and you know somebody that has that deep emotion that, that felt that they traumatic, would, traumatic, they wouldn't be lying about it, you know. Yeah, you know, it's something that, that terrible that they experienced. You know? Right, they have post traumatic stress from it. Yeah, PTSD. Yeah. Like somebody who went to war and experienced mm -hmm. these things, and mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, and, and that's another uh, sleep, not being able to sleep, is someone who's dealt with something yeah, traumatic. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. They, they, because they're 
they, they have these uh, reoccurring mm -hmm. nightmares or, yeah. uh, you know, just the, these flare-ups of, of trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. How about we, uh, this has been... But we, um, we can do another session. Yeah, let's you know? do another session because this has been a knockdown, drag out one. And I think uh, my listeners, who whoever they are out there, there's a few of them. Um, I think they're going to love this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to thank you for tonight. We're going to eat dinner yeah. together. We'll talk a little more. Yeah. But we'll save some uh, more incredible stories for another episode. How's yeah. that sound? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay, brother. I look forward to it. And I thank you for your time mm -hmm. today, okay? Stay tuned for the next one.